Let us pray. Gracious Lord, thank you that we can gather this morning in the presence of your Son, the very good shepherd who loves us so dearly to leave the 99 and find the one. Thank you, O Lord, that you continue to go after us and find us because your love never fails. So open our hearts, O Lord, this morning to that love and that great mercy that you so freely give us. We say, speak to us, Lord, your servants are listening. For it is in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, that we pray. Amen. Please be seated. I have a friend of mine who is a hospital chaplain serving in Texas. I've known this young man for several years, uh, initially met him as a seminary student, and over the course of several years there have been opportunities for he and I to get together. And he has sought me out as a kind of ch confessor chaplain, so I know a lot about what's going on in his life. He posted this not long ago. And this actually so deeply fits for me what I think of when I think about Jesus as the good shepherd that is being described in this passage. You know, if you go to any passage of scripture, it seems to me your two fundamental questions could be, number one, what does this passage have to say about God? Secondly, what does the passage have to say about me? And so this is the story. He went to a local store, a men's store, where he lived to buy some dress shirts. And a salesperson came up to him. Now, you need to know this about my friend. He, if there's anybody who would embody, you know, the fizz of a champagne glass, this is him. He is effervescent, he is bubbly, he is fun to be with. He never met a stranger. Always effusive and happy to talk to anybody. And so he's chatting it up with all of these various people in this men's store. And one of the workers comes up and says to him, you seem fun. What do you do for a living? And he said, well, I'm a hospital chaplain. Oh, wow. So you believe in God and things like that? Yeah, I actually do happen to believe in God. Oh, well, I, I don't, he said. And then my friend responded, well, that's, that's okay for now. And the man goes, wait, really? Isn't this is where you should be telling me that I should believe in God? And my friend responds, no, at least for now, it's enough to think that perhaps God believes in you, where you are right now. And that at least for now, that's enough. Now, that's a thought, the man said. He said, I, I thought you all had to be serious to believe in God. My friend responds, well, perhaps you're right, but belief in God is really about the joy of knowing that God loves you. Really about the joy of knowing God's love, a love so serious that you can't help but be joyful about it. Hmm, the salesperson said. I'll have to think about that. And my friend responds, well, I'm glad, but just be careful. Believing in God might be more fun than you're prepared to have. <laughs> End of the conversation. I have to tell you, I thought it was pitch perfect for this basically, I don't know what kind of God this man, the salesperson doesn't believe in. But more often than not, particularly young adults, say they don't believe in the God that they have heard about, more often than not from rather grumpy church people. <laughs> and they say, in fact, probably with some integrity, I, I don't believe in that God. And it's a shock for somebody from the church to say, well, I have to tell you, if that's the God you don't believe in, I don't believe in that God either. And then you begin to talk about Jesus. You see, the glory of Jesus 
is that if he is in fact both who he says he is and who we declare him to be, for example in the creed, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, Jesus putting it this way, Philip comes to him, one of the disciples, and says, show us God, show us the Father, because Jesus keeps talking about the Father. He said, show us the Father and we will be satisfied. And Jesus sort of shakes his head and smiles and says, I've been with you a long time, Philip. And you say, show us the Father? I, I and the Father are one. That's a full stop, shocking statement. But what we see demonstrated in Jesus again and again and again is behavior that is both what we would say out of the box, surprising, and yet at the same time utterly, at least for me I have to say, utterly and deeply satisfying. The, Jesus, the God that Jesus demonstrates quite honestly, is precisely the God I need. Notice the story even this morning where Jesus is telling the story of the shepherd. Now, you need to know for his hearers, there's surprises in this story. We've heard it a gazillion times. And so it sort of rolls over our head. But think again. First of all, the shepherd is Jesus is talking about a shepherd that has a sheep of 100. That's a lot. And yet Jesus is clear, as he says in various parables, that I know my sheep and they know me. In other words, he has an intimate personal knowledge. I mean, if we were to do it, and I actually saw someone do this not long ago, say, sort of said, okay, everybody two-thirds of the way back on this side stand up. And that's probably somewhere in the nature of close to 100 people. How would anybody know if there was somebody particularly missing unless you scrutinize that group of people very, very carefully? And yet here is the shepherd who looks over his flock, all of which you see to the untrained eye, look absolutely identical. Same face, same color wool, whole nine yards. And yet he notices that this great flock of 100 are in fact only 99. Where'd the one go? And so, number one, it says something very profoundly intimate about the kind of knowledge the shepherd has for each of those sheep. And then what does he do? He, he takes off. I mean, and actually puts himself in some personal danger. Because to leave the security of all that's right there and go off by himself, traveling how far he does not know when all he has in his hand to defend himself is a staff, what shepherds call, even today, their stick, is really not much defense. Oh, you might be able to swing it if you had one coming at you. But what if there were more than one? It would not actually get you very far. And yet this is the determination of this particular shepherd all the shepherd has is his staff, and he's going over the hillside, trusting the fact that the rest of these sheep are going to stick together, because actually that's the nature of sheep. To find the one, the sheep who, whatever happened, did the sheep just get distracted, and they're going there, and the sheep's going here, was the sheep see something over there? We don't know what happened that would actually cause the sheep to wander, but he's over, and God knows what's happened to the sheep. I mean, there's a lot of art about presenting the story of the sheep as one sort of caught in a thicket and can't like thorns and can't get out. But just as well, the sheep could have just been oblivious, off by himself kind of wondering what's going on, or the sheep could even be cornered by a predator and can't get out. And that predator needs some dinner and the sheep looks pretty good. Regardless of the circumstances, Aided only by his staff, the shepherd takes off, gets the sheep, rescues the sheep, and with a, a tremendous amount of personal knowledge, literally hoists the sheep up over on his shoulders. In other words, I'm not going to let you out of my sight. 
I'm not going to trust you just to follow behind me. And carries the sheep back and puts the sheep back in the midst of the fold. And notice what the shepherd says. I love this. This is actually my favorite verse in the whole story. The shepherd says to his compatriots, rejoice with me. For the sheep that was lost is now found. I don't know about you, but I actually might be more inclined to say, you know how I spent the better part of my day? This one stupid sheep who just can't follow directions to save his life <laughs> took off on the hillside. The poor thing probably would have died if I had not gone out there. It was hot as blazes, and all I wanted to do is get back to the comfort of being with the rest of the sheep in a place that had at least a little water and protection. But, it, you know, at least the sheep's back, stupid thing. There's, there's no finger wagging. None. Instead, Jesus actually underscores the rejoicing. For I, just so I tell you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. And, and in fact, don't be all religious about the rejoicing. It's almost like, yeah, break out the champagne. We're excited here. A party's going on in heaven. That's the whole feel of this story. And I love that because quite honestly, if truth be told about my life, and I think probably yours too, the reason that story strikes such a deep chord in me is because I'm very prone to wander. What's the line? Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. That's me. And the scripture is profoundly realistic about that. I mean, it's actually almost wearying to read the Jeremiah lesson and the psalm that is so basically cynically um, negative about the nature of what it means to be human. Foolish, stupid children, no understanding, skilled at doing evil, and on and on and on it goes. And there might be a part of me that says, well, that's not very good news. But the fact of the matter is, it's actually extraordinarily good news because it means I can't put anything over on God. He is the one, as we say most Sundays, before whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. You know, you can only be nice for so long and then something pops out of you that you wish didn't, wasn't there, right? Nod your head. I mean, little story. I've only been fired once in my life, thank God. But I got caught in a political thicket in the place where I was working. And as the young guy who quite frankly didn't know enough to know better, I was too naive at that point, I wound up being the fall guy for somebody else's jealousy. And so I was canned. Well, I knew enough, at a, I was like 25. I, I knew enough to know that I needed to forgive. I mean, that is what the scripture teaches. And I worked really hard at it, but it bruised my ego. I felt like it was unjust and people were embarrassed for me. You know, what are you going to do next? Well, actually, I don't know. And I thought I kind of had it down about forgiveness until I would sit down and find my mind wandering and what would come up is, I was wanting to kill the guy. And I was embarrassed, quite frankly, at the own, my own thoughts that were going through my head. <laughs> I mean, in some, so many ways, this cynical description is, in fact, a partial description of each one of us. Which is why I need to know that there is a God who is in fact that shepherd which seeks and saves, which reaches out and finds me. And that when he finds me in the thicket of my own misjudgments, my own sin, my own brokenness, what he doesn't do is say, what in God's name are you doing? Get back where you belong. But instead, wisely, literally hoists me up because I could get wandering again, you know, and brings me back into a place of safety, which is in fact the place I long for. 
I long to be in a place where there is peace, where my heart knows that I am forgiven, and that where I'm loved and accepted and received. And that's what we see in the gospel. Somebody who will come after me again and again and again. We, um, as you know, in the midst of this rather tumultuous day called September 11th, are rem remembering those who died in the plane crashes and the plane hitting the Pentagon and all of the various things that happened in Pennsylvania and others over the course of that horrible strategy. I'm thinking about somebody particularly by the name of Wells Crowther, who was a real hero on that day and actually exemplifies for me something of this shepherd. Because the story goes is that Wells was 24 years of age. He was a recent Boston College grad and he was serving as an equity trader on Wall Street. And he was right downtown when the plane crashes hit. He had served as a volunteer in the fire department as a part of what he was doing when he was a college student. And so his actions were instinctive. He just took off and went into the building and began to rescue people. He had in his pocket a red bandana. It was actually a commemorative of his dad who had given him, and then his dad had died when he was younger. And he'd literally had it with him almost all of his life since then. Even when he was a lacrosse player, he'd tie it around as a bandana before he put his helmet on and went out to play. So he had the red bandana in his pocket. So he threw his jacket off and took the bandana, wrapped it around his nose and his mouth, and rushed in. He went in rescuing people 16 times. And he knew what to do. He could tell this person to do that. He could pick somebody else. In fact, there's a very tender story. This is actually written up in the Wall Street Journal this weekend um, about how somebody who could not, because she had terrible physical problems, have never made it out on her own. And, this, and he picks her up and literally brings her back out again. On the 16th visit in, the building crashed on top of him and he died. If that doesn't say something to me about the Good Shepherd, who continues to rescue, who died on the cross for our behalf, I don't know what does. Heroism arises in the oddest of places, but heroism, real heroism, has its actual roots in the God that we love and serve, who has demonstrated that kind of heroism for us as those who are broken and lost sheep and do not deserve it. And yet, we are rescued again and again and again. These who are coming for baptism and confirmation are saying, I'm committing myself to this God, the one who loves me, who cares for me, who rescues me when I am broken and understands all of my frailties and my weaknesses, even the ones I don't want to admit to anyone. And yet I'm willing to trust in him because he cares for me in a way that no one else ever can. That's the heart of what we believe as Christians. That God loves us so much that he sent Jesus to die for us, to rise from the dead, get dead, and demonstrate to us a love that will not let us go. So I'm thrilled and proud of these who are coming. It's a courageous thing that they're doing, I said to them. There are people I know who think what I do is just delusional. <laughs> they don't believe anything I do at all. And I know they probably have some people like that in their life too. And yet, they're willing to say yes. As did you, when you were confirmed, when you were received. So join with me in renewing a commitment, not to any God, but the one who is the shepherd, who rescues, who loves, heals, and forgives, and promises to never let us go. Amen.